Hello and welcome to the training for the new production scheduling cloud application. This is the 10th of 12 lessons. In this lesson, we will cover the overall architecture, the end-to-end -end process with the key steps required from initial setups to creation of a schedule. We will also look at specific integration aspects and discuss some considerations when scheduling outside the regular scheduling cycle on an as-needed basis. Let's start with the first topic, the interaction of production scheduling with supply chain execution. Within the production scheduling cycle, the schedule refresh and schedule release are the tasks where production scheduling interacts with the execution system. At schedule refresh time, the current state of the relevant execution data is retrieved into production scheduling. And when the schedule is released, the work orders in the execution system are updated to reflect the schedule results. The scheduling cycle and scheduling frequency naturally vary by industry and individual customer and depend on the specific manufacturing environment with the involved lead times, the ability to react and so on. However, it is important to understand that the ability to reduce the scheduling cycle, cycle length and increase the frequency of the scheduling, as well as the ability to generate a new schedule ad hoc historically also depended on the systems integration architecture, possibly involving long running batch jobs. Production scheduling cloud is architected to avoid such limitations. We will explain that next. The overall architecture of production scheduling cloud as part of Oracle SEM cloud has the following key features. The schedule refresh reads relevant data directly from the execution system and does not require any long running batch job. Consequently, the scheduling cycle does not have to be tied to specific start times or, in, or integration job completions. You can refresh your schedule on demand. Now, the capability to refresh a production schedule outside the regular cycle, for example, in the middle of the day to consider new hot orders is possible. But keep in mind that if you choose to refresh a schedule ad hoc, then the schedule as it currently is within production scheduling will be removed. So if there are aspects of that schedule that you wish to persist then you should first release the current schedule before triggering any kind of midday schedule refresh. Before being able to generate a schedule, it is necessary to perform several tasks and this diagram outlines those. The beige and green colored boxes are setup activities while the red boxes represent the typical scheduling cycle activities. In setup and maintenance, item EFFs and work definition operation DFFs must be defined and deployed. These correspond to user-defined attributes that production scheduling can utilize. In product hub, product data hub, you manage item catalogs, item categories, and items. In supply chain execution, Work areas, work centers, resources, and work definitions are maintained and work orders are managed. Then within production scheduling, you define scheduling organizations and manage the item attribute group and manufacturing attribute group definitions. Refreshing scheduling organizations ensures that the specified attribute groups are then retrieved into production scheduling. And as part of scheduling organization data management, these attributes can then be used to define changeover rules or attribute sequences. Further, resource parameters must be added to the resource um, for, for specific resources to activate uh, resource constraints if desired. 
Once these tasks are accomplished, you can then define a schedule, specify the schedule options, and generate the schedule for analysis, adjustment, and schedule release. As mentioned already, different data elements must be maintained within the scheduling organization, and those are listed here. Note that not all of these have UI pages in the initial release of production scheduling, meaning that the corresponding data has to be managed via REST services. Please refer to lessons four and 11 for details on these data elements and the REST services. Now let's review a few specific integration aspects. First, if a work order in manufacturing has its form flag set to yes, then production scheduling will aim to schedule such work orders precisely as defined in manufacturing. However, outside the fixed time fence, resource and calendar constraints may require to change such work orders. Also, the scheduler may manually modify the work orders, which will be accepted. Next, if the scheduled flag on a work order operation is set to no for all operation resources, then production scheduling will schedule this operation with a duration of zero adjacent to the previous operation. If alternate resources are defined for a work definition operation resource, then production scheduling may offload an operation to an alternate resource if the work order is not formed. However, the scheduler can manually offload the operation at any time. Next, if resource instances are used, then those will not be offloaded automatically. And if multiple resource sequences are defined on an operation resource, then exactly one of them must be declared as principal resource. Production scheduling will then use the duration from that principal resource and consume all involved resources for that amount of time. All work orders will be scheduled with the currently assigned work definition. Production scheduling will not suggest using an alternate work definition. Resource efficiency and utilization percentages will be applied to operation resource duration. And outside supplier operations will be scheduled considering their lead times only, but not considering any supplier capacity. Next, all data for an item in production scheduling is presented using its primary unit of measure. And finally, all dates and times displayed for a schedule are in the schedule's local organization time zone. Now let's review a few items that you should keep in mind when launching a schedule, specifically around the schedule refresh time. We covered earlier that the integration architecture does not depend on any long running batch jobs and therefore any related latency issues are of no concern. Nevertheless, the accuracy of data in the execution system may vary over time and it depends on how and when shop floor completions are reported. The schedule refresh updates the production schedule with the execution data and the schedule data and schedule results therefore will be based on the same accuracy. Therefore, it is still worthwhile to align schedule refresh time such that schedule data accuracy is maximized. In summary, in this lesson, we learned about the overall architecture and how production scheduling and the execution system interact. The end-to-end -end process 
and the steps required to create a schedule. We covered specific integration aspects and how they are considered in production scheduling. And we covered some considerations around execution data accuracy and its relevance for schedule refresh and the timing of it.